This is Reason Revolution. I'm your host, Justin Clark. Thank you for joining us this week. This week, I sat down for another interview that I hope you find informative. Luciano Gonzalez is an atheist activist, journalist, and blogger. He maintains a blog at Pathos entitled Sin God, Spanish for Without God, where he shares his thoughts on atheism and current events and their relationship to the Latino community. Gonzalez grew up in Latin America and the United States, losing his Catholic faith during freshman year of college. Today, he is the director of the Honduras Project, a news organization that provides translations of Honduran news to non-native residents. He is also a founder and organizer for the Secular Latino Alliance, an online community for Latino non-believers. He currently studies history at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. We had a wide-ranging discussion about his path out of religion, what it's like to be an atheist in the Latino community, and his thoughts on the growing threat of white supremacy and violent extremism in North America. I appreciated his insights, and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Luciano Gonzalez. Luciano Gonzalez, how's it going, sir? It's going very well. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you so much for being on my show. I look forward to talking with you. Um, so, so to get started, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your deconversion, how you came to atheism, why, and um, where you are now. Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, my full name is Luciano Joshua Gonzalez Vega. I was born in North Carolina. My parents are Puerto Rican. They are both in the military, and because of that, I, throughout my life, moved to Central and South America. Um, I went to two different Christian schools. One was a non-denominational, overtly Christian school that even had Christian in the name. And then the other one that I went to was a school in Latin America where Christianity was a lot less overt. It was also considerably later in my life. It was during the last few years that I was in high school. And because of that, in addition to my family's own casual Catholicness, I got to experience a lot of religion throughout my life. By the time I came to college, I had started researching Christianity. I had started reading the Bible a lot more than I did as a child. And ultimately, by the time I had finished my first full school year at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, I deconverted. I became an atheist. All right. So one thing I think that we both share a passion for is history. Um, I, like you, have a, 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 am a historian. Um, and I basically, in some respects, became an atheist around the same time you did. Um, I became a, an atheist my first semester of freshman year of college, too. That was back in... 2009 so i feel kind of old but <laughs> um but but uh if you'd be so kind um kind of explain to me the process of how you sort of let it go and why what were you reading what were you thinking about so i have for anyone interested i was on a podcast called voices of deconversion where the entire topic is me talking about this but what happened with me was reading the Bible was the sort of chain that when it started unraveling, everything else slowly unraveled as well. And the first time I had actually read the Bible the first time all the way through when I was in middle school because I went to a Christian school and I was still surrounded by an environment that reinforced this and documented it as true, especially because the school I went to was an overtly Christian school. It was so Christian, it was anti-evolution. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it was a young earth creationist school. Although, I feel like that's a bit unfair. It's just that the teacher I had of those two years for my science classes were young earth creationists. Okay. I don't know if it's still that way now. I've heard that it's not from people who followed my story and went to the school and also deconverted. So, I don't know. But... Uh, <clears throat> For me, once I started reading the Bible, everything else, especially later on when I decided to reread it, because I was trying to sort of restart my own faith, I was, I knew that I was slipping away and I decided that I didn't like that. I wanted to believe and more than that, I wanted my beliefs to be true. So I started researching and remembering everything that I had once read, trying to see if it conformed with reality. The more that I researched, the more that I came to the conclusion that it didn't. And that was eventually the thing that caused me to realize 
that I couldn't believe in this and value truth at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I had a fairly similar experience too. Um, less with the Bible and more sort of just with philosophy in general. Um, I, I had read a couple books that were spe uh, specifically about epistemology. And at that point, I sort of systematically sort of rejected religion. Now, unlike you, I, I didn't grow up with religion. Um, I, my parents were non-religious. Um, I've said before, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've actually been to church for religious reasons. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to hear multiple perspectives on this because as someone who was sort of never in it, it's nice to hear sort of what it's like to sort of, I guess, sort of be in it and then, and then just be out of it. Yeah. Um, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. So for me, I feel like I'm trying to think of like the right way to say this. Mm -hmm. Despite what people think of Latin America, many people in Latin America are Christian, but they aren't necessarily young earth creationists. Mm -hmm. I remember living in Honduras, young earth creationism, which was what I was into when I moved to Honduras was actually sort of frowned down upon. Even the school that I went to, which was a Christian school, wasn't a literal Christian school. They had a Bible club, which is, and also most of the teachers talked about prayer and most of them didn't even pray themselves, but they were believers. But I actually got into debates. One of the first things that led me down the path, which would eventually take me to atheism, was the fact that I would get into debates in biology class and I would lose. And I'd wonder why it was that I was losing. So I start researching these claims more in depth. And that was the thing that made me realize like, oh, yeah, at least some of these beliefs are wrong. Yeah. And that's I think that's a fairly, you know, universal thing I, I've, I've listened to with people is this idea that you have these sort of sets of beliefs that you are sort of socially inculcated into. And then as time goes on, you realize how little of it actually conforms to, as you said, reality. And so at some point you're sort of trying to like, you know, kind of parse it and do what you can. And then it reminds you of that great quote by Dan Barker, where he says, you know, I throw the baby out with the bathwater and I realize there's no baby. And, 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 and I think it's fairly, uh, is that the case with you? Yeah, so for me, the trigger was probably about as dramatic as throwing out a baby that wasn't there. Because <laughs> the final trigger, and I actually mentioned this the other day when I was in the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast as mm -hmm. well. The final trigger for me was actually watching the movie God's Not Dead. Oh, wow. And, and like I entered the movie theater. It was literally as dramatic as me entering the movie theater as a Christian and exiting it realizing that I was an atheist. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I had a fairly similar experience during my deconversion period, but it was actually to um, a filmed version of uh, Julia Sweeney's one woman show, Letting Go of God. And so it was more of an atheist uh, thing, mm -hmm. but, it, but it was one of those where I watched her story of her going from sort of being a Catholic to being a Christian to being sort of interested in religion. And then finally just like, I'm, I'm an atheist. Yeah. And I, I realized probably by the time I watched it, I was like, no, this is, this is me. This is, this is me too. So I totally understand that. Um, so what's it like? What was it like with your family? Have you, are you, are you out to your family or? Yes. Okay. I actually, I contributed a chapter to a book that's going to be published in September where I mentioned this and I've mentioned it a couple of other times, like on film as well. But I told my mom and my dad on the same day. And uh, at that point, I had been an atheist for less than a year. I'd been an atheist for about three and a half months. It was the summer of my freshman year of college. And I was with my mom. We were in the car. And she's talking to me about how she starts praying. And I just look at her and I tell her, like, I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't just bring it up and be like, oh, mom, I'm an atheist. But since she brought it up, I was like, I'm just going to tell her. And I was like, I don't believe in God anymore. And she got a little bit quiet. It was an awkward car ride. But I'm very lucky in the sense that by that time the next day, my mom had already gotten used to it. And my dad, who is definitely a believer, he's, he definitely believes in God, was chill with it from the start. 
Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. My my folks were too. You know, like I said, growing up pretty secular, it didn't really matter. You know, my dad is pretty much like me. Uh, and so I remember having a conversation with my dad, my grandmother, who I grew up with as a teenager. And my grandmother is sort of a Unitarian Christian. My dad's sort of basically sort of a, an agnostic. I don't know if he's comfortable with the word atheist, but that's kind of what he is. And I said, yeah, I don't really do the whole God bit anymore. And they were like, okay. And I, I think they sort of knew. But part of that was like, I, I never, I, I had not actually read the word or knew of the word atheist until I was 18 years old. And so it was a really weird experience where I had never knew that was an option. Like, I think we grew up so many years where we just hear the God stuff all around us. Yeah. And we just assume it's a given. And it's not. And there's a point in your life, at least for me, and I imagine the same with you, where you sort of realize like, oh, wait, that's not the given. Like, you can you can do another path, which is so what I did. I... <laughs> In my case, it was kind of weird because I knew that there was a position where you don't believe in God. I was consciously aware that this position existed. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the name was until I heard of The Amazing Atheist for the first time. And it was watching his videos, which like made me be like, I should probably research the Bible more and see what I can think of to say if someone at my university comes up to me and is just like, hey, I'm an atheist. Like, I want to know both how to treat them with respect and also how to be like, I'm a Christian and here's why this is right. So for me, it was actually learning more about the fact that that word existed that made me want to go and research. Interesting. Interesting. So you've, you've come out and you are very prominently out. Your family's fairly cool with it and everything. Um, you know... So I know that you are a founder of the, I want to get the name right, the Latino Secular Alliance. Is that right? I am an administrator. Administrator? There. Yeah. So, so you're obviously well tuned in with understanding sort of what it's like to be a non-believer on some mm -hmm. level as a Latino, um, as a Latin American. Um, what is that experience life like? Because I've, I've talked with some other friends who... Um, are African Americans, for example, who mm -hmm. are non-believers, and how religion is such an integral part of that um, of that uh, ethnic group, and and it, is it the same at least in your experience, and and what has that been like to sort of try to navigate the waters of that? So Latino atheists are gradually becoming more and more prominent in the, I'm not going to say American, but in the United States secular community. Um, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the stuff, the American Atheist National Convention, but Shirley Rivera, who is the president of Atheistas de Puerto Rico, is one of the speakers. Um, I am a member and national director, not the national director, but one of the national directors of HAFRI, which is the Hispanic American Freethinkers. And as far as I can tell, the only group that experiences religiosity as intense, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, are probably the Arab community. Okay. So it is both in the United States and in Latin America. Religion is very intense. And I feel like American Latinos are probably a little bit luckier in that sense as an American, as an American Latin American who was born in the United States, is a citizen and has parents who are citizens. Like for me, I feel a little bit privileged both in the sense that I'm a citizen and other people in my family are citizens, but I'm also not the first atheist in my family. Okay. So that makes things a little bit easier for me. But I have friends who, if they had been younger when they told their parents, would have been kicked out. That's terrible. That's yeah, terrible. I remember, um, I know that one of the members of the Secular Latino Alliance uh, had some stuff going on with his family, but he was already an adult when he told them. So that made it a little bit easier. And there are actually members of us who are thinking of writing tips for like coming out to your parents because the dynamics are a little bit different than it is for white families. And I know that there are white families that are the exception to this where religion is everything. But as a general rule, in my experience and the experience of my friends, if you are a white atheist, it's a little bit easier or you can feel a little bit safer telling your family than if you're a Latin American atheist, where we invite our parents over for dinner. Um, they, we have baptisms at birth for most of us. 
Uh, we have, I'm trying to think of like some of the more, some of the other ways. We have brujeria, which is witchcraft. We have shops that sell how to defend yourself from voodoo dolls. Like religion and magic and superstition all play a very heavy role in Latin American society. Unless your family are more Americanized or they live in a place where there aren't as many Latinos. Okay. That, that's very interesting. I remember as a small child, um, my, my grandfather was a truck driver mm. and he went down to Texas a lot. And I remember as a very, 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 very small boy. So my memories aren't that great, but they're, they're vivid enough. Um, I was about nine. And we went across the border. So we were at Laredo, Texas, and I went over to a small, very small town, I think, which was called Rosa. And I just remember the, the thing that struck me the most in terms of the imagery that I saw there was how absolutely beautiful and, and um, ornate the Catholic Church was in town. And it was this really interesting contrast because I'd see this big, beautiful church. And then I would see as I'm walking down the street and it was also raining and it was flooding very bad because the sewage system wasn't great. And I remember just seeing, you know, sidewalks of panhandlers. And it was this weird juxtaposition between sort of the ornate and beautiful of the church and the panhandlers. And as a nine-year-old kid, you know, I didn't think much of it then, but I think a lot about it now. And it, it's, it's, that's, um, that's not unique to Latin America, of course, but that's something that I found very striking and it's a very vivid memory in my head. That's the way that it is with a lot of, even, even in Central America, I remember when, I love Honduras, I actually run a newspaper where I talk and translate about events in Latin America, specifically Honduras and occasionally Colombia. And one of the first things they tell you if you're a child of a diplomat and you move to Honduras is to stay away from the Suyapa Basilica. And it's very interesting because the Suyapa Basilica is, it's gorgeous. It is, in the entire time that I lived in Honduras, almost two and a half years, it was one of the most beautiful buildings I had seen. And I went to about 11 of the 18 districts, including to Roatan and to the other islands on the other side of the country. And it, it's honestly striking, but it's also one of the most dangerous parts of Tegucigalpa if you are someone from the United States. Wow. Because oh. you, will, you will get robbed. We had friends. I actually have a good friend who was an embassy worker who went there on her first day before she got her briefing and she got robbed. Wow. Wow. That, that's pretty harrowing, I would imagine. Um, and, and that's an interesting thing. I mean, that, and, and that speaks to sort of that, the, the sort of disparate nature of that in some respects, that there's this, this sort of beautiful, ornate churches, and yet there's, you know, a certain level of poverty and, 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 and crime and things like that. And that's, that's a very weird sort of contrast to deal with, especially if you're not used to it or not from there, you know as you yeah. probably well know. Um, so how did you, um, how'd you get into activism? Um, how'd you get into atheist activism? So when I first became an atheist, I thought to myself, on the very same day that I watched God's Not Dead, I made the decision that I would eventually become a vocal atheist. I didn't do it that day. I wanted to think about it more carefully, but I realized immediately that thinking about atheists, I couldn't think about anyone with a similar last name. Ironically, now that I've now that I've been involved in activism, now that I've started writing, I've actually met another Puerto Rican atheist leader who has my exact same last name, spelled the same way as me. Perfect. But I, <laughs> I wouldn't have met her if I hadn't started writing, if I hadn't started getting involved. And for me, the importance of activism is that I want other Hispanic atheists and Hispanic freethinkers to look to the atheist community and to realize that there's a place for them. There's a place where they can go and speak Spanish. There's a place where they can go and talk about the family issues that come up from being a Hispanic atheist and either not telling your family or telling your family and dealing with the backlash. I just don't want people who sound like me or who look like me or who have similar cultural backgrounds as me to feel alone in the secular community. I think that's really great. Um, one of the things I think that is, uh, I think, been a problem with the atheist movement and something I think in many ways we're now correcting with you and obviously 
you know, the work of other people like Mandisa Thomas, the black non-believers, yeah. and, and Faisal Sid al-Mutar and others, is to create a movement that's very uh, diverse. And because, unfortunately, most most of the public perceptions of sort of organized atheism, they imagine people who look like me or people who, you know, white guys, you know, you know, my, my first name is actually Robert. So my name is Robert Clark, which is about as English and American as you can get, even though I'm mostly by ancestry, I'm mostly German. But, uh, mm. but, um, but, you know, and most of them have much grayer hair than me, or at least that's the common notion of how people think of atheism. So I think it's really great that there's all of these new, fresh voices that are coming to the movement um, who give us a multiplicity of perspectives. Because like you said, if, if they don't, if people don't feel like they have a common um, uh, connection to somebody in it, then they may not feel comfortable enough to sort of be out or even comfortable just re letting go of religion altogether. So I, I, I applaud your efforts on that for sure. Um, so I guess my next question for you is, you're a historian or your your training historian, I'll call you a historian. My thinking is if you get into if you get into freshman year of college and you're saying history, you're an historian, what fields do you study and what is it about history that is interesting to you? So I attended the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I graduated in May. And my Congratulations. In, thank you. My degree was in history with a minor in anthropology. My personal focus had always been Central American history, very specifically Honduran history. I actually have a blog where I talk exclusively about Honduran history, in addition to all the other Honduras-related work that I do. But my the thing about history that got to me was actually originally that I was very interested in mythology. Specifically, I was interested in Latin American mythology. I wanted to work to popularize it, just like we have Greek mythology and Norse mythology, both of which are very popular mythologies now, even even for atheists. There are atheist writers who do fantasy work where they create fantasy novels, they create video games. I wanted to do that for Latin American mythology, and I would still like to do that in the future, but I mostly studied modern Central American history. The thing about history that eventually made me want to be a historian instead of, say, a religious studies person or someone who studies folklore was the importance of history to the modern day. I completely agree. So uh, my background is I have a bachelor's in, in history and political science um, with a minor in philosophy. And then I just finished my master's in public history. And, wow, nice. and, uh, and I wrote my master's thesis on Robert Ingersoll, the, the late 19th century orator. And his connections to the Midwest. I, I I mostly focus on Midwestern history. I'm here in Indiana, and uh, and 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 um, and religious history and intellectual history. So that's kind of what I do. And the reason that I found it important to do a a thesis that was framed within sort of my own personal view of of of, of life and things like that was that I wanted to to do a research topic that I could then use as a means to be able to go to different um, uh, atheist groups or free thought groups um, or secular groups and give talks about Ingersoll and sort of how he relates to the, the, the modern age, sort of um, what, what would he think of certain things. And so that was a real joy to do. And I'm much like you, and, and I very much agree with you in the sense that understanding our history, we can then hopefully um, uh, learn from it and not make the same mistakes. Or if we do make the mistakes that we sort of have, have sort of done them with sort of the bumpers on where we're, we're you know, we've, we've mitigated it as much as possible. So I definitely understand that. Um, the thing that was interesting when I gave a talk recently at Center for Inquiry here in Indiana, I was asked, what would Robert Ingersoll think about what happened in Charlottesville? And I said, well, Ingersoll was, was in his time a humanist. He wouldn't have been called that. But, but he would have certainly been outraged by the display of, first off, Confederate anything, monuments, flags, whatever, because he, he was a Union Civil War veteran and fought with the uh, 11th Illinois Cavalry and uh, was actually a prisoner of war in a Confederate POW camp. He and he 
spoke vehemently against the Confederacy and, and against slavery. And so I think he would have found the sort of call to heritage obscene, considering what he had actually lived in his own life. And so, you know, kind of moving on now to kind of the main topic, you you reached out to other podcasts to sort of talk about the problem of white supremacy and the problem of violent extremism and how it relates to our understanding of history and the horrible events that happened in Charlottesville that took the lives of three people, one Heather Heyer, who was the woman who was killed by the the head-on collision, and then two police officers who died in a helicopter crash. Um, It was a horrible, horrible moment. And sadly, our current president did not take that as a moment to do the right thing, but instead sort of made this sort of false equivocation chicken shit nonsense about how, well, there's very fine people and there's violence on both sides. And and I found that there was a lot of muddying the waters about this subject. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on this. So one of the things that I think is going on is I think that white supremacists, I've written about this before very vaguely. I'm going to try to describe this more accurately and with greater evidence than I'll probably be talking about here. But I think that what's going on is that white supremacists and neo-Nazis are beginning to weaponize historical revisionism. And for people who are listening who don't have, who aren't history people like the two of us happen to be, I actually didn't know you were a history person. That was really cool. Thanks. Um, (laughs) When I talk about historical revisionism, I'm talking about this idea of both erasing history and overlooking parts of history that go against a narrative that's beneficial to you or to whoever is doing it. And the reason I think this is that one of the claims that I have heard white supremacists repeat over and over again is that if we take away their statues, we're taking away their history. We're erasing tributes to a dark period in our past. And some of them even claim that they think that this is a dark period in our past but that we shouldn't that we shouldn't take it away from them that we are erasing history as someone who advocates for a significantly improved public history educational system that's nonsense but more than anything else this is dangerous because even well-meaning people who say this and who sincerely believe it because there are there are well-meaning people who actually believe that if we remove the statues we are somehow going to stop teaching these things in school. They believe that teachers take field trips to public parks where these statues are located, which is not what happens. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But more than that, they think that we are going to actually begin forgetting the horrors of our past. And lots of people in response have pointed out that German people still remember Hitler and there are no statues to Hitler, which is a good response, but also I feel like it's a good response if you're just in a conversation with someone, but if you actually want to have a detailed response, it's probably better to point out that German society generally doesn't really believe in memorializing not only the people who lost the war, but also trivializing the lives of their victims, which is kind of what these Confederate statues do especially without the proper historical context, that many of them being out in public and being the names of streets or churches definitely does. No, I agree. Um, In my field of public history, where we're mostly dealing with museums, historical societies, and and monuments in public places, this has been a really hot topic. It's something that we've talked about a lot. Um, I moderated a panel at the National Council on Public History earlier this year, and and we had a very long and I think very substantive, substantive discussion about this. Um, one of the things I think is important to make a note of to these people is that the vast majority of these Confederate monuments were put in in the first half of the 20th century. The vast majority of them, some of them are not even 100 years old. That the majority of them were put in in really kind of two periods, like the 1910s and 20s and the 1950s. And both of those periods are periods of of huge amounts of racism in the culture. The, the 1910s and 20s is the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan, which not only had a problem with African Americans, but also had a huge problem with Catholics, with Eastern European immigrants, and with Jews. And these monuments were sort of testaments to that sort of culture. 
The other part of it is the 1950s and 60s. So, for example, there are a lot of state flags in the South that have the star and bars in them, stars and bars, but those stars and bars weren't put on until either the 50s or the 60s. And that was a response to the civil rights movement. And all of these things, what they do is they basically say to African Americans and to other minorities, like, this is our country. This, this land belongs to us, it does not belong to you, and you will never be on the same plane that I am. And so when they go out there and they, when white supremacists go out there and say things like, well, you're erasing our heritage, well, that, they're, they're actually right in the sense that what they're actually advocating for is a history of monument building to sort of reaffirm white supremacy. Because those monuments, if you take them away, then it takes away that sense of the ability of those people to say, look at all this around us that's in our public spaces, basically saying that this is a white supremacist society. And if you take those away, um, then you take away sort of some of their power. And I've advocated for years in, in the discussion at NCPH, what we said was that I'm sort of of two minds on the subject. I think, one, I think it's very okay to remove them. I have no problem with removing them um, and either put them in a museum um, with interpretive labeling and some contextualization. Um, you know, make a point of saying, like, this Confederate monument was built in the 1910s. It was helped, you know, some of the funding for the monument was paid for by the Klan. Like, make a point of this is that history, right? Because I'm not sure if you knew you're aware of this or not, but in the 1920s here in Indiana, the Klan was huge. Um, the, the biggest place for the Ku Klux Klan was here in Indiana. Interestingly enough, it wasn't Georgia, it wasn't Alabama, it was the Klan. It was Indiana. And they, they you know, marched on my hometown. And, uh, and so it's, it's one of those things where by removing them from public spaces, we send a message saying that these symbols no longer represent our society. They never, or they never really did. Um, that they were they were monuments not to the Confederacy. That was the that was the excuse. But that these are monuments to white supremacy. One of the things that like I, I was actually going to ask you later on what you thought about uh, removing the statues versus putting them in museums or removing them to put them in museums. But I'm glad that you brought that up. But one of the things that I also wanted to point out is like if you actually want to talk about the South. If we want to talk about the Confederacy, there are statues that we could build that would be appropriate to do so. There are statues that we could build to the African-American soldiers. There are statues that we could build to the soldiers who didn't want to fight for the Confederacy. I know that North Carolina, as a North Carolinian who was born here, who was kind of raised here, a lot of the history I've heard concerning the Civil War is how North Carolina was, if not the last state to succeed, one of the last states how theoretically we lost the most soldiers. Like these are things that we can build monuments to that one, aren't Robert E. Lee, and two, wouldn't offend Robert E. Lee because Robert E. Lee actually didn't really want statues or monuments to be built, which trivialized the war and helped perpetuate this idea that the South is still interested in, re in keeping its wounds open, so to speak. No, I very much agree. One of the, the classes I took a couple years ago was um, a class on historic site interpretation. And we read some work about the, the um, monuments and the interpretation at Gettysburg. And one of the things that happened, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, was that these monuments, which were both for the Union and for the Confederacy, that these were ways of being able to sort of mend the wounds between northern whites and southern whites. And that's why, for honestly, most of Civil War scholarship up until I think honestly about the 50s or the 60s when that changed, there was very, there was either misdirected notions or complete negations of the impact of slavery. And so you'd get these like arguments about, well, it was really about economics and well, it was really about, you know, states' rights and federalism and this and that and the other. And that's them sort of nibbling at the edges because the real issue is all of these issues became issues because of slavery. Um, one thing that's interesting to me is that there is not a national monument um, to um, for slavery. 
there is not a national monument to tell the history of, of slavery in America. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is something I think that's rather important. Um, but monuments were used as a way to sort of bridge the, the, the northern whites and southern whites so that they would ignore the fact that they fought the war over slavery. And, then, and that kind of re-perpetuated the white supremacist narrative, um, which is part of the reason why I've always had a problem with the monuments to begin with. They're not, to me, they're not terribly historical. They're, they're monuments to make people who lost, who are racists, feel better about themselves. Like, that's really what it is. And, and, and the northern people went along with it because they wanted to make nice and keep the country together. And so it's, these, these were made out of really bad compromises. And the problem is, is that now we're living in a culture that has evolved so much on, 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 in so many ways on the issue of race that the sort of moral barometer has dramatically changed. And we're going to see more and more of these monuments go away. Um, I, I have no doubt in my mind. And I applaud the, the, the public leaders who do it. Because to me, they're not monuments to history. They're, they're, they are totems of white supremacy. And I'm okay with them going away. And I'm more than fine with them either just being in a basement and nobody seeing them. And I'm also equally okay with them being in museums and being interpreted. One of the things that I think that we could do to further advance this conversation is talk about, especially since you are a public historian, I am a historical communicator, which as someone who has heard about the National Council of Public History, I wonder if you've heard that term, but it's a relatively new one that was introduced in, I think, about 2015. It would appeared on a blog post on the National Council for Public History. It was by Jason Steinhauer. Pretty sure I said his last name correctly. Yeah. Yeah. He and I are actually acquainted. We've called each other, but I very deeply support this term. This is something that I think has been needed for years. But as an advocate for proper historical communication and for historical education that's actually factually based rather than being used to narrate to someone to advance someone's ideological position or a historical position, I think it's important that these statues not necessarily continue to exist, but actually be contextualized properly, including information about the people who constructed them and who called for them to be constructed, because that's something that people don't realize. These statues did appear in the 1910s, 1920s, through the 1950s, by and large, and that's good information, but that doesn't tell you anything about the people who actually ordered them to be created, which is something that is really valuable to know. I, I agree, and that's where these, these monuments are, I think, good pieces of historical information because they don't really tell you much about the period that they're trying to commemorate. They're really telling you much more about the period in which they were made. And so when you can talk about the 1910s and 20s, you can talk about the wave of anti-immigrant sentiment, the wave of the Ku Klux Klan, and the anti-Catholic sentiment that was going on at the time as well, that you know, that's how these monuments, I think, are in some respects useful. Um, in terms of Steinhauer's work, I follow him on Twitter. I've never talked to him. I, I would love to reach out to him because I love what he's doing. Um, he is a very friendly guy. You absolutely should. Uh, I think what he's doing is great. And and he's doing, he's doing for history what a generation ago Carl Sagan did for science. And, and, you know, Carl is one of my heroes, you know, Sagan is part of the reason I became a public historian, because I didn't want to just be a scholar and sort of the stuffy ivory tower. I wanted yep. to do historical scholarship that was relevant to people. And that I could share with everyday people, because my thinking on the subject is, is that if all we're doing is making history for each other, then really, we're not doing anything worth of value. Because to me, you know, history is a broad component of a of an old term that I love, but I use all the time called civics. Mm -hmm. And civics is the broad term today. They use social studies, but I prefer the term civics. That's history, economics, government, um, and you know these these fields in public schools are not always adequately taught. And I think that one way that we as history communicators can sort of correct that is to be um, both scholarly in our research and in our interpretation, but also accessible and and entertaining it in our delivery. And so that's what I do. I, my job is I work on 
um, our my my state's digital newspaper pro project. I work for um, one of the state agencies here, and what I do is I write you know blog pieces and and I do. Twitter and I've done public speaking events and things like that, sharing with people how people can use historic newspapers. And I think that that's one of the things that's important to me as a public, as a public historian is getting the message out there because I don't like in my opinion. I just don't really like the, the sort of the attitude or the sort of the milieu of academia. I don't like it. I, I think a lot of these people are stuffy and their their heads are so far up their own asses that they're just sort of incapable of being able to see something and how it can be relevant. Um, so uh, I'm very much interested in, and I'll reach out to Jason. He's He seems like a really great guy and he's doing some great work. So I'm really glad that we're on the same page. It's really cool. So I I wanted to talk about, especially since you're a historian, I think this is going to be a really cool part of this discussion. Yeah. I wanted to ask you what you thought the role of historians ought to be or theoretically in the future will be when it comes to dismantling white supremacy. Sure. So I think one of the ways that we do it is by creating, like I said earlier, I think it's about creating work that is scholarly, that is accurate but that is not compromising. So for example, I did a recent blog post for my job here at the Stork Newspaper Program about an evangelical preacher named Billy Sunday, who used to go around the country and give speeches. For a number of years, he lived in Indiana, and for six weeks back in 1922, he held revivals in, in Richmond, Indiana. And the newspaper in the town, the Richmond Palladium, covered his revival every single day. They gave his his revival a special like two or three page supplement in the newspaper. They would print his his sermons verbatim. They would print a bunch of stuff. Well, about a month and a half into his revival, the Ku Klux Klan came to one of his sermons. And there's this story about 12 men, and this is how the Palladium uh, reported it. There were 12 men clothed in the traditional robes. They walked down through the tabernacle. They went up to the pew to talk to Sunday. They gave him an envelope. Inside the envelope was $50 in cash and a letter, basically telling him how wonderful he is for spreading, you know, God's message that, you know, and then they, and then they go on to say like, you're, you know, you present the good Protestant uh, Christianity for America and you and, you, and, and then they basically say, we are the Ku Klux Klan, and we believe in this, 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 and this. Now, Sunday, when this happened to him, he basically took the money, and the, the, the papers described him as being dumbfounded, which I'm not sure what that necessarily means to them when they came up. Which is interesting because his stage manager, a guy named Bob Matthews, was quoted in the Palladium saying, Billy Sunday has had encounters with the Klan this entire year going around and giving sermons all across the country. He had this very same thing happen in St. Louis. So I don't know why he would be dumbfounded other than the fact that that he would be, you know, who he is. But here's where it gets interesting. So Sunday takes the money, looks at the audience, basically says something along the lines of like, okay, now if we don't say anything, then, we're, then we'll be all right. And then he basically goes into this, this bit about how he doesn't belong to any fraternal organizations. But he... Then instead of like talking about how racism is bad or or how the Klan is bad, he basically doesn't pass. He passes judgment on them and then goes on to to complain about liberal Christians. Like he goes on to complain about the more the more non-literal and the more sort of uh, tolerant sects of Christianity. So in one moment, he could have been a hero and sort of like stood up and said, no, I don't support you. I'm not going to take your money. Not only did he take their money, he didn't he not only took their money, he passed judgment on them and then basically slammed people who wouldn't like the Klan. Now, does that make Billy Sunday a racist? I don't know. I can't say. I, do, I can't read minds. He's dead. He's been dead for 80 years. But what that does say is how problematic it is for a man of national prominence to be that naive about the Klan. And so when I write it just like that, like I just described it to you, that's a subtle way of doing it. You know, because I work for a state agency, I can't be that overt with saying like, you know, mm -hmm. Trump's a fuck and why are we dealing with the white supremacists? But what I can do is write scholarship that makes a point of like, this stuff has a long past in our country's history. 
And there have been people who've risen to the moment, and there are people who have not. And Billy Sunday was one of those that did not. And he is sort of passing judgment on them while at the same time bashing liberal Christians sounds a lot like violence on all sides. And some are very nice people. It's very similar, you know. And so, you know, uh, you know, Karl Marx says this great quote, which is that history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. And sadly, I think that's the case. So that was sort of my roundabout way of answering your question. So if you work for a state agency like I do, it's a lot harder to get away with overt political opinions. Yeah. But what you can do is you can do scholarship that's sort of subtle jabs. Um, for example, my colleague, Jilly, who works at the, the um, Historical Bureau with me, she's written a whole section about how Indiana newspapers covered um, the, uh, the extirpation and execution of the Jews and how, how basically how they covered the Holocaust. And she uses it as, and she quotes the Nazis directly when they're in the papers. She quotes what happens to, you know, Jewish people as they're then sort of made to take certain labels. They're then taken to the ghettos and things like that. And it's eerily similar to what we hear from the so-called alt-right, which there's nothing alternative about. It's the same old racism and same old xenophobia. But these are ways to do it. If you don't belong to a public agency and you're an independent scholar, one thing I advocate for is public speaking. Um, public speaking, public programs, exhibits, any ways that you can sort of use America's history, its long history, and talk about its problems of white supremacy, talk about its problems of racism, slavery, anti-immigrant, um, and, 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 and how a lot of what we hear today against Muslims was the very same things we heard against Irish Catholics 100 years ago. So these are ways to sort of make the parallels so that, and if you do it in a think in a way that's informative and engaging and you're passionate about it, people will listen and they'll make those connections. You know, you can make your material so effortless in some respects that, that you don't have to make the connections. The audience makes the connections for you. And so you don't have to. Um, but I do think it's important, you know, to be an activist. Um, I've always said, and this is sort of my belief, that all history is activist history. You're advocating for a position or you're advocating for a view of life. You don't lie. You don't misstate people. You don't, you don't use the sources against you. But you do make an obvious effort to say, I'm studying this because I want people to learn. And I want people to learn from the mistakes of the past. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer. I apologize, but hopefully that gets to what you were wanting to ask me. So I, I'm working on an article that should be published by the end of the week, if not before the end of the month, but I am writing an article about what I think historians can do to combat white supremacy. And one of the things that I think that we can do, especially if you are someone who is actually getting paid to do history, I'm not getting paid to do history. That would be awesome, though. <laughs> but <laughs> In time, my if, friend, in time. If you have the resources and you have the energy, and especially if it's your specialty, it's important that we address these claims. Because what some white supremacists, some of the smarter ones are doing, is they are weaponizing a historical narrative. And it's something that I'm sure people can find if they look back far enough. Probably not that far. But there is probably precedent for this. That being said, it's important that we as historians, when they make claims about history, when they make claims about white heritage, when they make claims about a past that they envision of the United States, it's important that we look at those claims. It's important that we listen to what they're saying. And it's important that we deconstruct it and that we see if it has any merit. And then if it doesn't, it's important that we say that this is an ahistorical vision of the past. I, I agree. Could you elaborate a little bit about what you think in, in your in your analysis of this so far? Um, what are some of the, sort of the common things that white supremacists use to create a narrative? So some of the common things that they use is in my experience, and I actually have done like unofficial research, I have spent time like sort of trolling and lurking on these pages because I want to see how it is that they envision the United States. But one of the common things that they do 
is they want to position themselves as not necessarily victims, but possible victims. They want to showcase that they have things that they could lose. They have things that they could forget. One of the common things, especially, is this idea of removing statues, which was the reason that the Unite the Right rally took place in Charlottesville. It was it all revolved around the statue, which is fascinating for me. I'm sure future historians and I'm sure present day historians who actually have specialized training in this have far better analyses of it than I do. But it is fascinating to me because they and people who think more or less like them, even if they think less dogmatically and less extremely, will look at this and they'll be like, yeah, no, they're taking away our history. They're viewing history as something that they could lose, which is fascinating to me because I don't think of history as something that simple. I think of history as something that is taught and something that you never, like once you have knowledge of an event, if that knowledge is actually accurate, then you can never lose it. No, I agree. And the thing that's interesting too is that the one of the beauties of, of history, much like science, is that when we get things wrong originally, we can go back. When new sources are made available, we can reinterpret those events and we can create a more accurate picture of what went, went, went on. Um, that is sort of oftentimes counter to the narratives that people often like to portray. Um, one of them is, is, you know, just as a funny one that I think about a lot, is Warren Harding, um, who was president from 1921 to 1923. He died in office. He died of a massive heart attack in a San Francisco hotel room. Um, he went on a trip. His doctors told him he wasn't supposed to go on. So when he died... In 1923, Calvin Coolidge became president, and there were many, many books written sort of eulogizing Warren Harding. Um, but what happened was, is as the decades went on, his reputation became worse and worse for a few reasons. One, as you probably well know, was the Teapot Dome scandal, um, where his secretary of the interior, a guy named Albert Fall, basically took a kickback from the oil industry and then basically tried to like sell off public lands to do oil excavation. And this was all done in the dark. And this and, he, you know, he would he would eventually be convicted of crimes as well as a bunch of other people would. Now, this all happened after Harding died. So there was like a period where people were sort of eulogizing him. And then there was a period where they went, oh, no, he was actually kind of a fucking scumbag and and owned by the capitalists. Cut to a couple of years ago, his private letters were donated by his family to the Library of Congress. And when his family donated them, they said, do not release these until 50 years after we give them to them. Basi basically saying, we don't want you to release this stuff until we are all well and dead. And there's a reason for that, um, which is that Warren Harding was a bit of a Lothario. Um, he had mistresses for years. In the 1950s, there was a woman who published a memoir claiming that her daughter was the offspring, the illegitimate child of Warren Harding. And it's true, she was. Um, but what these letters contain are basically extremely sort of um, disgusting, very lewd conversations he would have with some of his mistresses. And he even had um, he even had a nickname for his penis. His nickname for his penis was Jerry. And so when he would when he would um, sort of talk about his dick in these letters. He would say like, Jerry longs for you tonight. Jerry wishes to be with you tonight. Very salacious, which is interesting considering, you know, we're coming right out of the, we're out of the Victorian period. We're into the progressive mm. period where social mores really weren't that great. So here's a president who died and was sort of a martyr for his death. Then it turns out he was actually kind of a fucking scumbag and ran the government like it was a fucking corporation. And then years and years later, he turns out he's a fucking perv and cheated on his wife. And so now Warren Harding is universally recognized as one of the worst presidents in American history. And that all happened in a span of, of 75 to 80 years. So history can change based on new information. That's kind of a funny one, just because I love to tell the story about how the fact that Warren Harding had a nickname for his dick 
Um, but uh, John Oliver did really great bits about Warren Harding. Um, yeah. But uh, but but yeah. So so that's one way. But in a more serious note, one of the things we can do is is better interpretation of the Civil War. As I mentioned earlier, in the first half of the 20th century, basically up until the 1950s and 60s, when there was a wave of new scholars and scholarship, um, the majority of Civil War histories were written very ster- in a sterile fashion. They mostly focused on military aspects of it. Um, they mostly focused on the mythologizing of Lincoln, or in the Confederacy's case, the mythologizing of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. And so what you would get is instead of history, you get hagiography. Um, and, and, and the notion of talking about slavery was sort of this ancillary thing, and we're not going to bring it up. Cut to the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, you have a wave of new scholarship on slavery in America and the slave trade, fugitive slaves. And this all culminates with some modern Civil War scholarship that's really great, like James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom, um, Eric Foner's work on the Civil War, um, and other really great scholars. So things can change. And, and my attitude has always been that, that a final history has never been written. You know, that we're gonna, we are going to always recheck the assumptions that we've made as scholars and base them on our evidence. And so that's what I think is very important in combating this sort of stale narrative that white supremacists want to push so that we can, by recontextualizing history with new information and new sources and new scholarship, we can then, we can then take the narrative away from those who seek to use it in, in dubious ways. So I think that something that one of the things that I think you were talking about actually related to an idea that I had for something that should be at the very least in public high schools, we should have a course on people using history as propaganda. I agree. And, yeah, because like it's uh, I can think of a few examples. One of the best examples I can think of off the top of my head for a historical figure who underwent a transformation like Warren G. Harding at least in our understanding of their personal history, is like Mother Teresa. And I know that it's really easy for us as atheists to pick Mother Teresa, but it's it's still true. Like, the research that's been done on her, and it's entirely possible that in the future the research will be debunked and people will have a completely different opinion of her. But even then, it's like we have to question if it's actual historical research that's being done or if it's propaganda, because there are lots of people who like to claim that Mother Teresa wasn't necessarily a good person, but she was backed by the world's greatest propaganda machine, the Catholic Church. Yeah, I, I agree. If, if based on my expertise and sort of my knowledge of modern American political history, I would love to teach that class. You give us like a semester and you teach the first half and you do like Mother Teresa. I take the second half and I would do Ronald Reagan. Um, I think that would be really good, especially because then we could keep it from being personal too soon. Yes. People could get used to this idea before we jump them into something that could actually offend them and make them want to distance themselves from the course and what we're teaching. Exactly. So I've learned a lot about Ronald Reagan. I, I find Reagan to be a very fascinating character because he's a study in contradictions. You know, this is a man who claimed to be a very devout Christian that never belonged to a church until he was in the White House, a man who was very personable and funny and light and could light up a room, but yet had very close friends and was often very cold and private, somebody who sort of had very conservative rhetoric but often was actually fairly pragmatic as a governing agent. Um, there's the myth of Ronald Reagan, which the, the GOP loves to hold up, and then there's the reality of Ronald Reagan. Um, the myth of Ronald Reagan is this idea that Reagan, um, you know, really believed in fiscal responsibility and would have balanced the budget and this, that, and the other. And the reality is Ronald Reagan ran a deficit in his budget with Congress every single year he was president. He came into the White House in 1981 with the national debt somewhere between 700 and 800 billion dollars. He leaves the White House in January of 1989 and the national debt ballooned to 2 trillion dollars, the majority of which was military spending. So there you know he's also the governor of California that legalized abortion before Roe v. Wade legalized it nationally. He's also, as president, 
passed the last major piece of immigration reform the country's ever had and gave amnesty to three million illegal immigrants. Now imagine a Republican doing that today. These are the things that I think are important. Is I like to call the propagandized version of Reagan. He's Saint Reagan, right? Uh, you know, holy be on high, praise be upon him. And then there's the the reality of who Ronald Reagan was, who was a real guy, who you know had sort of very strict conservative rhetoric, but often when push came to shove, wasn't actually as conservative as his acolytes or his, or his um, idlers would think of him being. And so I, I'm fascinated by that. Um, I had a professor in undergrad who loved to teach her history courses with political cartoons and editorial cartoons in newspapers. They're a really great window into seeing how people act and, 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 and seeing what, where sort of the temperature of the politics were at the time. So I very much am in agreement with you that you know we could teach – the ways in which history is used to weave a political narrative. Hmm. The, well, I'm sorry. The other one I was just thinking of off the top of my head is you could do a version of that in the reverse, which is Martin Luther King, where there's the sort of sanitized mainstream interpretation of Martin Luther King, where, you know, he was where sadly it's a horrible trope, but they, but there's a lot of implicit sort of white supremacy in the way that Martin Luther King is interpreted in the public schools, where they sort of preach him as being the, what would have been the language of the time, the quote unquote respectable Negro. And then there's M Malcolm X on the other side, who is not. And that's sort of the implicit racism of how that's interpreted. And it's still that way today. If you go to a public history class, or not a public history class, but a public school history class, when in reality, they were deeply complicated men who had an interesting and sort of symbiotic relationship with one another. The other thing is, is that Martin Luther King was fairly radical. You know, most histories of Martin Luther King, particularly in the public schools, pretty much stop after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They should really go on further and talk about the Poor People's Campaign where he moved to Chicago and lived in the slums in 1966, 1967, his staunch opposition to the Vietnam War, and his advocation for a more democratic socialist country. They never do that because that doesn't fit the narrative that they want to preach. Um, that there's, there is the, the king that they like to hold up, and then there's the radical king, and they don't want to teach the radical king. You don't really learn about the radical king until college, or if you actually go out and read about King yourself. So there's other ways that they do this all the time, you know. Another figure that would actually be very interesting where instead of like um demystifying a saint or like I guess showing the more human side of sanitized figures, we actually show the more human side of demonized figures, such as Margaret Sanger. Yes, I agree. Everyone, everyone, not everyone, but liberals, in my experience, love to ignore Margaret Sanger, aside from the fact that she founded Planned Parenthood, and conservatives cannot stop talking about her and her racism. And the truth is far more complex than that, because she was a complex human being who was actually not necessarily well-loved by the African-American community, but did lots of genuine work for African-Americans with African-Americans, employed many of them, like worked to train them. And that doesn't necessarily mean that she can't be racist. But of course, there's the truth about the matter, which is a whole lot more complex than someone who wanted to say, exterminate black people. Yeah, I, I very much agree. Um, the thing about Margaret Sanger is, is she was of a generation of what I call sort of white patricians. Um, these were people who came from the middle class who had sort of the, the privilege and the resources to be able to advocate for a position. Now, unfortunately, a side effect of that at the time was sort of an, a, I don't know, like a, like a tyranny of low expectations where they just assumed that minorities were sort of lower classes because they were of sort of this like patrician class. And this is certainly the case with people like Franklin Roosevelt, who came of age in that sort of patrician, 
um, wealthy situation where when he then becomes president, he's not as full and forward on race as, say, his wife is. Um, and never really was during his presidency. Um, and so I, I'm very much in agreement with you on that, that I think it's it's history is often complicated and the narratives that are often the case are not always the, 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 the whole context of everything. Um, I hate to fall back on an, on an on a adage that, you know, Bible thumpers use, well, you got to put in context, but it's true, you do. One of the things that I think is neat since we're talking about the white, I don't know how to pronounce that word. My English isn't always that great. Patrician. The class that yeah. you were talking about, yeah. the white patricianal class, is that Latin Americans, especially Latin Americans in the United States, many of whom were raised in Latin America like I was, have actually started writing and talking about this. And we started talking about what we call, and of course this is an oversimplification, but what we call like a white man's religion or like a white man's politics. And one of the most interesting articles that I read was um, by Prisca, Prisca Dorcas Rodriguez, who is a writer for Huffington Post Latino Voices. And she is someone that I admire a whole lot, but she wrote an article about growing up in church. And in it, she talks about like the white man's salvation. And she herself seems to be a believer but she like there there are lots of Latin American believers who are very critical of religion, who are very nuanced in their examination of it, some of whom have even started exploring Latin American atheism. And I look forward to seeing their work. But it is very interesting to see a concept that you brought up now that I have heard in my own circles. Yeah, and, and it's and, and part of it is the fact that I totally agree. And it's something that not only did African-Americans face, but other minorities faced as well. And the thing is, is it, it often reminds me of a classic idiom, which is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. And and I think one of the, you know, there were a lot of people of that period, particularly people who advocated for some of the more egregious forms of pseudoscience. Basically, you know, I'm talking about eugenics is this idea that by sort of purifying the races, we can then purify society and create sort of heaven on earth. Um, a lot of the progressive movement, um, which, you know, people like Margaret Sanger and Jane Addams a few years before her, and then would eventually come to its culmination in figures like Woodrow Wilson, who was a Presbyterian, very devout Christian, who used Christian um, messaging and Christian allegories as a way to sort of promote both sort of his view of progressivism, i.e. a heaven on earth, and his view of fighting um, the, the Great War or World War I. That there is this sort of, when you were talking about white man's religion, I completely agree. Because if you look at that period, the progressive period, what a lot of these leaders were doing, because many of them were very deeply devout believers. Yes, there were a lot of them who were sort of secularists like Sanger was, but there were a lot of very devout believers. And what they wanted to do was sort of create a heaven on earth. And they believed that in creating a heaven on earth, that they would fulfill God's promise on earth and that America represented God's promise to the world. And that by advocating for a sort of larger role for the federal government in terms of social services, we can then create that sort of um, progressive heaven on earth utopia that can then be the divine providence that America is supposed to get. And that is very much out of the white middle class Protestant tradition. Um, and, 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 and to me, it just seems like what we're fighting against now is the, you know, because I see it in a lot of ways, you know, I see it with the white supremacists, I see it with some of the more forms of the extreme left, that there is this utopianism. And one of the things I would love to get across to people as an historian is that utopians, utopias never work. No matter any form they come in, whether it's, you know, the, the sort of religious utopias, um, or, or communism or, you know, extreme forms of socialism, you know, Wilson's idea of the Providence land, they always end in, for the most part, they always end in, in horrors and they always end with, with people dying and, and with liberties being limited. 
And so one of the things I advocate as a scholar, as an historian, is for people to not fall so into utopian thinking. And white supremacy is a form of utopianism. And if we can pick and sort of put cracks in the idea of utopianism, we but we thereby make cracks into white supremacy. I think that's a very good point that I actually hadn't considered before. I think that one of the ultimate I think that one of the ultimate defeaters of white supremacy in the future will be history teachers. And I think that moments like Charlottesville are forcing legislators and not not just historians to have these sorts of conversations. But they're also going to eventually force lawmakers and um, advocates of public education to rethink the way that we teach history. Because obviously, like the simple reality is that white supremacists in Charlottesville and elsewhere have weaponized the Civil War. And most importantly, they weaponized our both lack of understanding of the war and also our ignorance. And these two things are actually very different because our lack of knowledge is not the same thing as our ignorance. Our ignorance, from the way that I see it, is our misinformation, whereas our lack of information is actually the literal information that we do not have about the Civil War. I agree, and I would also say that not only do we do that with the Civil War, but we do also do that with the Holocaust, Um, and that we don't really teach the Holocaust in a way that we should. Um, I didn't really receive any education in the Holocaust until I was a freshman in high school. That's sad. Um, you know, and, and I, and as a little kid, I may have known something about it, but until, and it wasn't even in a history class. This is the part that's crazy. It wasn't even in a history class. It was an English class. And it was because we read Night by Elie Wiesel. And that was really the first time I'd ever learned about the Holocaust, and I'd learned about the the extermination of the Jews and the horrors of the Third Reich. And, th- th- you know, that was very shocking, you know, to me. And then in college, I think my sophomore or junior year in college, I took an entire course in the Soviet Union. And I went through that whole cycle again, where you learn about the, the purges, you learn about the show trials, you learn about the, the first five-year plan, the second five-year plan, the agricultural pogroms, the mass exterminations, the, 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 the mass famines that led to the deaths of tens of millions of people. And it, it just goes to show you that one of the things that we're really advocating for is fighting against tyranny. One thing that I've been really happy about lately, and maybe happy is not the right word, but, but I've been very encouraged by, is the fact that a best-selling book has addressed this very issue, um, Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny. Um, and Timothy Snyder, uh, I think is a professor, I think he's either Harvard or Princeton, and he wrote this small book about how do totalitarianisms, how do tyrannies cultivate members, uh, whip up, the, the status quo, assume power and maintain it. And he lays it all out for you. And he uses the horrors of the 20th century with fascism and with communism to explain that we are not above this. You know, um, you know there, there was a novel, I think written by Sinclair Lewis, called It Can't, you know, um, uh, it, it, it Can't Happen Here. And it's about fascism taking over America. And Sinclair Lewis has this great quote, which you've probably heard before, which is that when fascism comes to America, it will come, it'll mm-hmm. come, it will come cloaked in the American flag and the cross and bearing the cross. And I agree with him. Um, fascism in this country will not come with, in my opinion, will not come with sort of the, the overtness of, say, the, the Nazis. It'll come in the way that we've seen it where it's the propaganda campaigns. You know, if you look at a, a, a publication like Breitbart, for example, uh, it, is, it is a bastion for, you know, this extreme conservative proto-fascist viewpoint. And it's not much of a jump to go from Breitbart to something like Stormfront, which is a white supremacist group. They often advocate for the same things. And some of the language that somebody like Steve Bannon who's now out of the White House, thank goodness, uh, 
but but who you know is the language that we heard from the early 20th century fascists and so Snyder makes a point of like laying out these essential um, uh, bits of wisdom that people need to learn about how tyrannies work and how to avoid them and and so that's that's I think an important component to historical scholarship is to avoid tyranny because the problem that I've seen in this country particularly over the last year year and a half is that there's a creeping, it's a creeping fascism that's happening in America. Um, sadly, in a country that has in many respects um, made many leaps and bounds in terms of race, race relations, in terms of gender relations, we've made huge strides. But what this new wave has done with the alt-right white supremacists and with Trump and the White House has sort of, it sort of normalized it again and the goal for us as scholars is to denormalize it. We need to make it weird. You know, this is not normal, you know, and, and, and it isn't. What we're living right now is not normal and it should never be taken as normal. You know, Donald Trump is not normal. You know, he's the exception of American democracy, not the rule. And, and, and so our goal as scholars is to really make that point and drive that point home. I think that one of the most important things that we can do additionally is it's not just confront it, but it's, it's share resources so that way not only do we defeat these individual points, we give people the ability to learn at the very least what historians presently believe. Because as we've talked about before, history is an ever-changing field and it's growing and changing all the time. But if we want to give people the tools so that we don't have to do everything, or especially because we can't do everything, but if we want to reach out to the people who actually want to know what we think as a community, then it's important that we give them the resources so that, like, so that they can do things themselves. I actually, when I wrote about uh, Charlottesville and Confederate statues, I wrote an article for my blog on Patheos. I, at the bottom, was extra careful. I was like, look, if you want to fight against this, here are the groups you can support. You can reach out to them. They have members. They have people who specialize in this. But additionally, they also have organizations which support people who fight against this. I know that the American Historical Association, for example, has the Association of History Teachers, which is a very important group because they fundraise, they lobby, they fight for the rights of history educators. It's not just enough for us to go and speak publicly we also have to give people the resources and the knowledge to continue the fight themselves. I completely agree. One of the great resources that we've shared um, at the Historical Bureau um, is um, we've recently started a podcast. And one of the episodes we did was um, in the early 1920s. I know we mentioned before I talked about sort of the Klan's influence in Indiana. Well, between 19, basically between 1923 and 1925, the Indiana state government was basically controlled by the Klan. Um, they had elected a Klan governor. The, the state legislature was basically controlled by the Klan. And they were all under the thumb of a guy named D.C. Stevenson, who was, at the time, the, the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He had an immense amount of power. He sort of turned his role as being the head of the Indiana Klan into sort of being a political boss. Um, and that helped him elect a bunch of people. And the Indianapolis Times, which was a daily newspaper that ran in, in the capital, did basically from basically like 1920 to 1927, 28, did extensive coverage exposing the Klan's infiltration into the Indiana state government. And they would eventually run um, articles that would expose the governor at the time, who was the Klan governor, a guy named Ed Jackson, from taking kickback money from the Klan. And then he would eventually um, be censured by the state legislature. He would not be removed from office. He would not leave. But he left office in 1929 in disgrace um, and obviously didn't seek re-election or whatever. Um, the, the Times won the Pulitzer Prize in 1928 for its coverage of the Klan. And we did a whole podcast about that. Um, we also have an entire historical marker. That's what the Historical Bureau where I work at does. It mainly does historical, metal historical markers you see outside. They did a whole one for the Times. 
We did a blog for that. We did a podcast for that. Both of them are hyperlinked to the sources. So you can click on them. They go right to them right away. For my other blog that we run that I do, which is for Hoosier State Chronicles, which is the newspaper stuff I run on, we did an article about the Indianapolis Times as, as just a paper, a history of the paper. And I went into the discussion of the Klan, and I put hyperlinks to all that as well. That's one of the things that we really care about at the Historical Bureau is making things accessible to people. So we do the blogs, we do the, the podcasts, and then we do social media posts where people can click on things and read things. And, and so they can either get a little bit of a short bit in the social media or they can get it in a more long form in the podcast and in the, the, the blogs. So I totally agree with you about making things accessible. I really appreciate it. This has been an, a wonderful conversation. Um, this is the part of the show where we'll be wrapping up, and this is the part where you get to plug whatever you want. So, as I mentioned before, my name is... I never noticed how dark my hair is. Um, my name is Luciano Gonzalez. I run a Patheos blog, which is named Sin God. People spell it differently. Um, it's supposed to be two words, but the reason for the name is it's supposed to be kind of a play on words. It is sin, not necessarily for the word, you know, sin when you transgress on God's divine law, but the Spanish word for without and then God. So that way people know that this blog is in English because that confused a lot of people. Um, on that blog, I talk about history, atheism, and politics. I also spend a lot of time writing about Latin America. Obviously, a lot of my Latin American coverage is focused on Honduras and Puerto Rico, my two homes. But I've also written about Colombia, where I lived when I was a little kid. I've written about Argentina, and I've written about Chile and Belize. I'm going to be writing more in the future about more different places as I start to write more and more. I also have a podcast named The Benito Juarez Experience, which I co-host with Dr. Juan Navarro Rivera. We talk about a lot of stuff. We're actually filming a Charlottesville episode in a couple of days, so that's going to be really cool. And I would just love for anyone who enjoyed this conversation to come and find me on social media. Awesome. And I will include the links to all of your content in the description box, which will appear below for everybody. Um, Luciano, this has been an immense pleasure. Thank you so much for talking with me tonight. I have really enjoyed it. It's really nice to, to meet another person in sort of the atheist space who's also an historian. I'm like the only one I know, at least so far. So it's nice to meet you and get to talk to you. And I hope to have you back sometime soon. I would love to have, I would love to be back. Um, if you ever want to talk to a Hispanic atheist, you should send me an email, Hispanic Heritage Month. I don't know if you know when that is, but it's from September 15th to October 15th. I have lots of people, including people in groups that I'm a member of who are going to be appearing on podcasts and stuff. I also have a list of Hispanic speakers and the topics they like talking about. If you want to see that list, I'd love to send it to you. I would love to see it. I would immensely appreciate it. And I, hopefully maybe we can have you back for that. I would love to be back. This has been genuinely... I, I haven't had a conversation on a podcast with another historian before. So I've talked to lots of different people. Mostly I've talked to activists, but I've also talked to PhDs in political science which is one of uh, my co-hosts. He has a PhD in political science. I've talked to a historian once, but we were talking about Latin America. This is the first time I've gotten to talk to a historian of North America. And it was a lot, there was lots of energy. It was great. We talked about really important stuff and I would love to be back for any topic if you'd ever be interested in talking to me. I would love it. We'll, 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 we'll definitely get that together. Luciano, thank you so much again for being on my podcast. You have a great night. You too. Thanks. Take care. You too. And that was my conversation with Luciano Gonzalez. That's it for Reason Revolution. Please subscribe to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. If there's a platform you listen to podcasts on that I'm not on, please let me know and I'll try to make it happen. Send us your feedback at reasonrevolutionpodcast at gmail.com. Also follow our Facebook page at facebook.com slash reasonrevolution. You can follow me at Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at The Daily Clark. Until next week, this has been Justin Clark, and this has been Reason Revolution. Reason Revolution.